We welcome you this morning to the Cookstown Independent Methodist Church on this Lord's Day, Easter Sunday morning. And we trust that you're well. Our thoughts and our prayers are still very much with you. And as we said last week, we are missing our coming together the way that we are is our normal. But I thank God that we're able to meet in this fashion. I just have one announcement to make today, and that is that our Church Gazette is uh, published. Some of you will have received it, but I, Timothy and Stuart have been working hard on all these things, and it will be at the front door of the church on Monday morning in a box. And so if you uh, would like a copy, you just come and take it from the box at the door. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow again in your holy presence this morning. We thank you that as we come before you today, just to know that you are the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for that way that you both opened up for humanity to come to you. And we thank you today for the death of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through your poverty might be made rich. Thank you for all that you have in store for us on this Lord's Day. And I pray that you might open our eyes, open our understanding, and we ask you that you'll speak, Lord, in thy stillness while we wait on thee, hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. We thank you that death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my Saviour, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, we thank you that up from the grave you arose with a mighty triumph o'er your foes. And as we would meditate again upon the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'll draw graciously near and go with us through the service. We remember our situation here in our province and in our nation and indeed throughout the world today. And we realize, Father, how quickly things has changed. And yet we bless you today that you're the one who changes not. And so afresh this morning, we lift our eyes unto the hills, from where comes our help, our help cometh from the Lord. And with the psalmist we can say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless your holy name. We thank you for making it possible, even for our service to go out over the internet uh, this Lord's Day, and for those who listen to it even, maybe a little later on. And I just thank you today for the word of God, that is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. We give you thanks for Stuart and for Timothy uh, here, Father, and for all the work that they have done behind the scenes. And I just pray that you will bless their efforts. We realize that you encourage us in your word that whatsoever our hands find to do, to do it with all our might for your glory. Pray for the congregation that your blessing will be upon each one. Bless those, Father, that are elderly, those that are in care today, those, Father, that are perhaps closed in their own homes. And I just pray that they might be conscious of the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Pray, too, for our government. Lord, you tell us to pray for those that are in authority. We thank you for the wisdom and guidance that you've been giving to them. And I just pray that you'll continue to work out your plans and your purposes. Remembering our Prime Minister today, we ask you that he might continue to know his your touch, Lord, upon his body, and that soon, Father, that you will be pleased even to bring him home out of hospital and answer prayer in a remarkable way. Thank you today that you're working out all things together for the good of those that love you. Remember, too, those that mourn, and I just pray, Father, for those who have lost loved ones as a result of the coronavirus, that you will draw near to all such 
and that thou, the God of all comfort, will give the needed help. Pray to you, Father, this morning for uh, Hartford and Phyllis Arnold. We know that many years ago they were in this little church here sharing about what you had done for them. And we realize, Father, that tragedy has come to their home this week, even through the tragic death and that motorcycle accident, Lord, of their son. And I just pray that you will bless uh, their son's wife and the little daughter and grant that as a family today that they might be very conscious that they are being upheld in prayer. We look to you, God, that you will bless the reading of the Word of God, and that even on this Lord's Day, that you will lead us afresh to Calvary. We ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel and chapter 27. We're going to commence our reading at verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, Save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. That is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias or Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints were slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done. They feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. May God bless his precious word to us on this Lord's Day morning. My topic for today is from these few verses that we have just read together is entitled, The Miracles of Easter, or perhaps I would rather call it at times, The Miracles of Calvary. Realize today, as probably most are aware, the word Easter is never mentioned in the Word of God. And so whenever I keep referring to our topic this morning, although we do I remember again the death of the Lord Jesus 
at this Easter time and his resurrection that is very, very important. Well, let us keep returning to Calvary. At the time, whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was facing death on the cross, there was a chain of miraculous events that give a glowing testimony to what was happening and something about the great power of God that was being manifested here at Calvary. I want us to notice this morning the uniqueness of Jesus Christ uh, as testified here in his death and also to his claims that he was the Son of God. And even his very enemies had to cry out that truly this was the Son of God there, the latter part of verse 54. Very briefly today, I want us to notice at least five of these miracles. I realize that that is all that we will have time to look at this morning, though there are many more miracles that we would see or could look at from these verses of Scripture in Matthew chapter 27. The first one that I want us to notice is the miraculous darkness at midday. We read there in verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. There was also then in verse 51, the rending of the veil. That was a miracle, how the veil of the temple was rent in twain. The third miracle that we have read about here in these verses is the shaking of the earth and the very rocks that were splitting. The fourth one is the opening of the graves. That was also a miracle. And the last one, if we have time to look at it today, will be the coming forth of the bodies of the saints. And we know that Paul made tremendous reference to the fact that one day the dead in Christ shall rise. We know whenever he was writing to the church at Corinth, he went into great detail if we do not believe in the literal bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain, and all those that have died even in Christ has died in vain. But thank God today that we do believe in the literal bodily resurrection of our Lord and Saviour. Luke describes the happenings, the same as verse 45 of Matthew 27, the miracle of the darkness at midday. In Luke 23 and 45, we read the words, and the sun was darkened. The darkness from 12 noon until 3 p.m., is sometimes maybe passed over without very much common by many of the Bible expositors. But it is great meaning not only because of the significance of the cross, but because darkness itself is an important concept throughout the Word of God. We know that throughout the Scriptures that darkness and light, those two words occur many, many times. I understand that the word for that is used for darkness appears over 160 times in the Word of God, and the word for light, 229 times. The first act of God in Genesis was to remove the darkness by the creation of light. Whenever John is writing, he reminds us that those that say they have fellowship with Christ and walk in darkness, they lie and do not the truth. The Greek word that is used here is a very strong in its meaning. It simply means the sun is self-filled or the sun stopped shining. It is now noon, the sun is high in the sky, and suddenly there's total dismal darkness. It falls all over the land, 
accompanied by the somber silence. At the brightest time of day, darkness fell. This can only mean one thing, and that is that the entire Earth, the whole entire solar system, was cast into outer darkness. We know whenever John was cast onto the Isle of Patmos and he sees down through the avenues of time in the book of Revelation, he reminds us that uh, those that die outside of Christ, after they appear at the great white throne of judgment, they shall be cast into outer darkness. One of those terms that is used for uh, describing the awfulness of a lost hell for all eternity for those who have rejected Christ's offer of mercy. We read here that there was darkness all over the land. And I just want to clarify again that the word that is used for land in the Greek that it may have referred to the earth or it may refer to a region of land or a country. But can you imagine the scene? What must it have been like in just a moment of time that the world is plunged into darkness? There's no abusive language that has been used now. There's no wagging of the heads by those who have tormented the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no more jeering at a ceased. There's only horror, amazement, shock, fear, suspense, and the anxious whisperings of the onlooker. In a moment of time, we read that there was darkness all over the land. Christ had already hung on the cross for three hours before this darkness fell. The first three hours were filled with activity. There was the movement of people. There was the sound of the voices. But with this darkness came tremendous silence. All activity has ceased. A movement came to a very abrupt halt. And during these three hours, the chief priests, they're complaining about the superscription that was written right over the top of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the King of the Jews. And someone had uh, got a board or a piece of a sheaf, and they wrote these words, This is the King of the Jews. They nailed it to the top of the cross. The chief priest sees it. It annoys him. They didn't want to give any glory to this God-man, God in the flesh. And those words were rewritten. He claims to be the king of the Jews. The chief priests and all were outraged. I want to point out, dear friends, this morning that here was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's shedding his own precious blood those great drops of blood that you and I might be saved. Back in the year 1987, I conducted a gospel mission outside Cookstown here. There was an old couple, they're long in the glory, who attended those meetings, who attended the prayer meetings. And that old gentleman, he used to talk about how he found Christ as his saviour. He said that one day he went into a meeting, or one night rather, and the preacher was preaching about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The preacher made it very clear that if you go out through that door, you're trampling afresh upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember that godly old gentleman saying that he said to himself that night, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. Maybe you're listening to the service this morning and you look back and God has spoken to you many, many times and he has beckoned you to get saved. He wants to save you. He wants to transform you. He wants to adopt you into his family and his fold. But you've rejected 
Christ himself. Remember, the word of God tells us that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as receive him, to them give he the power or the right to become the sons of God. And so suddenly things changed completely. Suddenly the voices were quiet. The chief priests, the soldiers, the mocking crowd, they were all silenced by darkness. There's not a sound in all the earth that can be heard except the shedding of the Saviour's blood as it falls to the ground. God is the creator. He is the one who placed the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets into place. And he is the one uh, that caused it, uh, these things to happen, uh, these miracles here at Calvary. As a miracle, we do not understand it. We only have the evidence that it occurred that there was this tremendous darkness. One had asked how or to show us a sign from heaven, and one certainly was given, uh, and others were going to follow. God's word is true. What has been prophesied in the word of God will come to pass. The Roman centurion standing close by he got the picture at the close of the event. He exclaims, truly, this was the Son of God. And certainly, this man was innocent. May we ever remind ourselves that he is the one who suffered the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Scripture teaches us about another coming day, another coming day of tremendous darkness, what is described as the tribulation. In Isaiah chapter 13 and verses 9 to 11, and I'm going to take time to read these verses. Dear friend, think about it. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof, out of it. For the stars of heaven and the consultations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. The darkness was designed to hide Christ's sufferings from human eyes. It was not fitting that man should see the Son of God in this hour, this hour of intense suffering, when the sin of this world was placed upon him. Whenever the one who knew no sin became a sin offering, for humanity. The hymn writer well describes it. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. Isaiah the prophet reminds us, and the Lord hath led upon him the iniquity of us all. Maybe you feel that you're too great a sinner to be converted Maybe you feel today that you have committed some sin that could never, ever be forgiven you. I was reading in my daily readings today about the Samaritan woman and how that she comes into contact with the Lord Jesus at the well of Shiner, how she is transformed by his grace and her sins are forgiven. Maybe there's someone and you're struggling with the fact that you've committed some sin and you feel that it could never be forgiven. I'm glad that the gospel message that we preach here today, that I believe is very, very scriptural, that all manner of sin can be forgiven. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Man could 
only hear the great cry in verse 46 there, that tremendous cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabathani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was a tremendous miracle. We read about another miracle in verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The miracle of the rendering of the veil of the temple. I do understand the significance of this. We must understand the veil. The veil and the ritual of the temple took its meaning from the tabernacle, as is described in the Old Testament. The veil was a covering. It was a concealment and a barrier that stood between the holy place and the holy of holies. It spoke of a barrier that separates man from God. In the Old Testament ritual, it showed the way into God's presence was not open yet. The temple in these days was divided into three areas or parts. There was the outer court where the congregation was permitted to enter. There were then was the holy place where the priests entered. There was the holy of holies where the high priest could enter. The veil stood blocking the congregation and separating the people. The people were separated. They were outside and away from the mercy seat. They were separated. They were outside the ark of the covenant of God, outside of the presence of God. The congregation were shut off and not allowed to approach the holy of holies. Only the high priest could enter once a year and only after he had been properly cleansed according to the ceremonial law. The veil stood as a barrier, a barrier which sent a place between the sinner and God. The breaking of the veil showed the price had been paid through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, there's some tremendous hymns in our hymn book and in many church hymn books reminding us about the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus. Many today could scoff or laugh at the fact those that would describe it as slaughterhouse religion. But may I, dear friend, in all sincerity, remind us that nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the tearing of the veil down the middle from top to bottom had miraculously showed that Christ's work was a work of God. Christ's work was sufficient, it was complete, complete. No human works or, relig or religious system could ever accomplish what Christ had done on the cross. And so we find that was a miracle. We read thirdly then that the earth quaked. As with the darkness and the splitting of the veil, this occurs at the same time. I want you to note that it was a loud voice of a victorious and dying Saviour, which split the veil, shook the earth, broke the rocks, and opened the tomb. Whenever he cried, he cried. The work was done. Whenever Christ cried out on the cross, it is finished. I want you, dear friend, to be aware, as I'm sure that you are, that history within this world of ours records many, many earthquakes. We know that earthquakes of any proportion can cause tremendous damage and even a great loss of life. But the Bible says here the rocks were rent. They didn't just move or crack like a normal earthquake. They were torn apart. They broke open. The very graves opened. Folks sometimes wonder why the graves opened whenever nothing else was disturbed. Our text tells us, and the tombs were open. They were open. The significance of the event here, the crosses didn't move by the earthquake. 
They weren't displaced out of the ground. Imagine the scene around the earthquake, the rock splitting in the middle, the graves and the tombs bursting open, but the three crosses on Calvary's hill were undisturbed. If it had been a natural quake, the crosses would have fallen. What do these miracles teach us, friends, today? It teaches us that the power of death is broken. On the news every day, there's a record of how many people are dying in the UK and how many die in Northern Ireland and how many in the south of Ireland and many in this world in the various countries that are dying as the result of the coronavirus. But I want to say, dear friend, if people die in Christ today, that is so, so important. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The graves were open immediately after Christ's death and victory over every sin. They were opened and eventually we're told they're going to go in to the holy city and appear unto many. Whenever the earthquake happened and the rocks was rent, the buildings in all Jerusalem would have been destroyed. Remember, many would have been hiding from God in their homes, hiding from the miracle of the darkness at noonday. Thousands in Jerusalem would have been killed as those clay houses collapsed. Hundreds of buildings would have been destroyed. But God had a plan for, the, for those people who rejected Christ. His plan was that they could see the veil torn apart with the rest of the temple in place. His plan for those who rejected him and the prophets that they could see the graves open. Remember, this happened during the Jewish festival, the Passover. It was unlawful for anyone to cover the bodies on this sacred day. So the bodies lay for a full day for all to see. What was God's plan? God's plan was for these people to see the uncovered bones of the saints. The last miracle came three days later. It stands apart from the other miracles. The graves were opened by the earthquake and the bodies of the saints didn't come out of the graves until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Verse 52 and verse 53 reminds us and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints were slept, arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Many misunderstand this. After the resurrection, the bodies of the saints arose and appeared unto many. Keep it in mind, dear friends, today that it was the earthquake that caused the graves to open. But it was three days later, by the power of the resurrection of Christ, that the bodies of the saints were raised. Yes, on this Lord's Day morning that we call Easter Sunday, on this special day, I'm glad that we're not serving a Christ that is on a cross, a Christ that is in the tomb, but no, he's living, he's ascended, and he is glorified. What does this teach us? And with this, I conclude this morning that God is the power to reunite the body and the soul while we are separated at the time of physical death. In Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who give it. And then I conclude today with the last miracle, and I leave it with you to think about. Uh, the, the last miracle from the cross, it points towards the great resurrection morning when the dead of all ages shall rise. The Apostle Paul, whenever he's writing to the church at Thessalonica, he reminds them, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, 
concerning those which are asleep. And then he goes on and he says, But the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What does Calvary mean to you today? What does the death of the Lord Jesus Christ mean to you? Is it just some historical fact that there lived a man and that he died at 33 years of age, that he died on a cross? Is your faith today just an historical faith? Or you believe that it happened, it happened sometime in the distant past? Or can you say today that because Christ suffered on that cross, because that he gives to you the right to come to him, I want to ask you, dear friend, today, do you know something of the power of the resurrected Christ? We sing sometimes in the church here, it's an old gospel hymn, it's sung for as long as I've been around. Even before I was converted, it was sung often in meetings. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. On that bright and glorious morning, it will be a glorious morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of the resurrection share, when a show chosen one shall gather to their homes beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Maybe you fall into the category today, like Cleophas and his friend. You can read about them in Luke chapter 24. And they're traveling on the Emmaus Road, and they're sad, they're discouraged, they feel defeated. They know that the Lord Jesus has died on the cross, their true friend. And then this stranger from Galilee joins them. And this stranger from Galilee, we simply read those words, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And they invite the Lord Jesus into their home and we're told that they ate some fish and so on. And then he disappears. Oh, what a miracle, the miracle of Calvary. The miracle of the death of the Lord Jesus. The miracle of the darkness over the land. Oh, the miracle of the very graves being opened. The miracle of the earthquake. But friends, it will be a wonderful event whenever the Lord Jesus returns. Maybe you are saved today. And like Cleophas and his friend in Luke 24, you're feeling sad. Maybe you're going through some experience. I think Cleophas and his friend tell me today that there was such a thing as a sad Christian, but Jesus himself drew near and went with them. May God bless his word to us this Easter Sunday morning. And may you sense the resurrected Christ drawing near and going with you. Amen. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you so loved this world, that you give of your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in you should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for the way back to God, from the dark past of sin. We thank you for the door that is opened and all may go in. Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as a sinner to Jesus. And we thank you for Calvary. We thank you for the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, shed for rebels, shed for sinners, shed for me. Thank you that throughout the Word of God, right from the book of Genesis to Revelation, we thank you for the scarlet thread of the blood. But we thank you, O God, that we do not need to bring 
animals to offer to you any longer. Thank you that you are the perfect sacrifice. We ask you, dear Father, that if there's any that are listening to this message who as yet do not know you as their own and personal Saviour, I pray that they might come to that crossroads in their lives where they might say, Christ, for me. Are there any, Lord, that are listening and perhaps they feel sad or defeated? I just pray that they might sense you drawing near and going with them. We continue to pray for the situation in our province. We ask you that you'll continue to remember the National Health Service workers and the emergency services. Thank you, Lord, for all the hard work that they're, they've been doing, many of them putting their own lives at risk. I just pray that you will put your protecting hand upon them today. And dear Father, we just pray this morning for those that may feel vulnerable, those, Lord, that may feel isolated. I just thank you today that you are the comforter, and I pray that you will answer prayer and meet need. We commit ourselves to you. We pray that the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit will be our portion on this Lord's Day and until Jesus comes or calls. In your lovely name we pray. Amen.